with KG Tropicals. Last week, John shared his story about his biggest mistake he ever made in fish keeping. He also had nine other YouTubers share their story as well. Well, this week is part two, and we're gonna talk about my biggest mistake, which is really bad, and you may even wanna unsubscribe to KG Tropicals because it's, it's really bad. But anyways, we're gonna have nine more YouTubers share their story too. This is a perfect opportunity for all of us to learn from each other's mistakes. You get to see that just because you make YouTube videos, you can make mistakes too. You can learn from our mistakes and why don't you just tell us what yours are? Put them in the comments below. I wanna hear what your biggest mistake is. It's probably not as bad as mine. So let's get started. Part two of YouTubers' biggest mistakes. Hey there, it's kind of mute, isn't it? How about this? Mm, too colorful, much better. All right, so my worst fish keeping mistake is pretty much I remember my 12 gallon Mr. Aqua bookshelf tank. Oh man, so that tank went through a lot of configurations and the tank was only $100. You know, decorations, probably the canister filter. It had an Eheim 2213 on it. It went through a lot of phases from goldfish to crawfish, but I remember this one phase um, where I wanted to put in orange eye blue tiger shrimp. Two years ago, they were quite expensive, and still today, they're pretty expensive. But I remember buying $400 worth of shrimp. See, the thing is, with a 12 gallon bookshelf tank, there is no lid for it. <laughs> you can see where the story is going. Um, needless to say, they all jumped out and, you know, leaped to their deaths, pretty much. Um, I believe maybe it was because it's too high of a flow for the 2213. I had a glass lily pipe on it. I don't have footage of it. I just don't want to remember it at all. And thank you, John, for making me bring it up again. So, um, yeah, $400 down the drain in less than a week. And that's probably the worst fish keeping mistake I've ever made. All right, time to get out of here. Later. All right, how's it going? So I'm Lucas Bretz of LR Bretz Aquatics, and you wanna know my biggest mistake, and after keeping 300 some planar aquariums, so many species, shrimp and everything, I would say probably my biggest mistake out of this whole venture would be that I would buy fish and not be the fish. So I was often guilty of going to the fish store and being like, oh, that's a cool oddball, I wanna grab it or whatever, I'd buy it. And I mean, I'd keep it all right, but it wasn't until I actually learned to be the fish that I actually really started keeping fish really well. Same with shrimp, be the shrimp. So you gotta think about like their habitats, where they come from, what kind of waters they like, temperatures, uh, just the uh, aquascaping, the decor around them and all that. And that actually helped me a lot with breeding and learning to keep fish a lot more healthy and keeping them more comfortable. And it wasn't until I actually started letting Mother Nature do a lot of the work, put my faith into her, because she's been doing this a lot longer than any of us have, um, have I really had a whole, I mean, I always had, I had some good success, but you know, I'd like, I'd get some losses here and there, but it's like, I hardly lose anything now. Now that I let Mother Nature take care of their, like what she does, algae, it's a great equalizer. I don't run filters, I run some airlines, not many, but most of my tanks are kind of like little ponds and I don't know. It was once I learned to become the fish and be the fish and what they like, because often we'll give them too much current, they're always having to swim against it, they can't go at their own leisure. Fish aren't always in the current. Granted, like some are, but a majority of them aren't. Um, this is a really big topic with going into all that and like trying to teach people how to get their faith back into mother nature but I guess that's what my channel's for but I would say that would be my biggest mistake would be buying the fish and not being the fish and I actually learned that from Eric Bodrock that's when it really like hit home to me when he said that to me so ever since then I've really thought about being the fish and ever since then I've made him more comfortable and that's been a huge 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 help and advantage to breeding them and just 
seeing better behavior out of them, just seeing them happy and healthy. And I think that's what's important with keeping fish. So there you have it, my biggest mistake. Hey guys, and welcome to the fish room. I'm Rachel O'Leary, and John and Lisa have asked me to share with you my biggest fish keeping disaster. Um, I like to think of it more as the steepest section of the learning curve that is aquarium keeping. Um, for me, I operate about 60 to 100 aquariums in my basement fish room, as well as about three to 4,000 gallons of water gardens in my yard. And I have been keeping fish my whole life, but only been really into it like I am now for the past 15 years. 10 to 12 of which have been spent as an online retailer of small fish, invertebrates, and plants. With that sort of growth and the sort of level of insanity that I have uh, within my hobby, there's been some tough lessons. Now, I think most of us are probably aware of the absolute importance of quarantining our fish. We need to make sure new fish are healthy, that they don't have any internal or external parasites, that there's no latent illness, um, and that we need to protect our display aquariums as well as our healthy established fish from those new fish, as well as the new stressed fish from our existing fish. But what a lot of people don't think about is the need to quarantine plants. And that is the story that I'm going to share with you today. So I guess about 12, maybe 13 years ago, I started importing from all over the world um, as most stores just didn't carry the things that I was really interested in working with. And this also meant that I had the ability to start importing plants from mainly Asia. And I was really excited about this because when you run as many aquariums as I do, it can be extremely costly to try and have them all planted. And the plants that I tend to work with are low light plants, things like anubias and ferns and mosses plants that aren't particularly fast growing. So being able to purchase them in bulk for an affordable amount of money was huge for me at that time. And I was absolutely excited. I ordered about 300 Anubias, uh, I believe from Singapore, and picked them up at the airport, brought them home, looked them over. There was no visible issues. Um, there was no obvious algae, there were no obvious pests, which makes sense because when you're getting plants shipped internationally, they have to have certifications that they're uh, plant pest free, which means things like nematodes and snails or anything that could harbor um, bacteria or organisms that could be a threat to our native plants. Um, so they looked beautiful. I dropped them into my row of shrimp tanks. At that time, I was working almost exclusively with shrimp and other invertebrates. Didn't think anything of it. Went upstairs, came back down the next morning, and every single aquarium that I had added those plants to was full of 100% dead livestock. Now, it, again, it was all shrimp. And what I didn't realize, and what I wanted to tell you guys about today is that in order for plants to be shipped internationally, if they're, they're grown in a nursery, they have to be treated with pesticides in order to make sure that those nematodes and snails cannot be on the plant. I thought that just rinsing my plants and adding them to the aquarium would be adequate to remove any of this residue. But the moral of the story is it's not. So if you're buying imported plants, please make sure that you give them a week or two weeks in an aquarium without invertebrates in order for that pesticide to wear off. It may be a good idea to run some carbon or use something like Purigen or Polyfilter or whatever your chemical media of choice is to remove any of those impurities that could have been on the plants. Now, you could say quarantine is also important as well if you're buying plants from hobbyists and that way you don't add things like duckweed or bladderwort, utricularia, um, pest snails, or anything that you personally find undesirable to your aquarium. So the very moral of the story is you can never be too careful. We are responsible for the well-being of the inhabitants in our aquariums and quarantine is always a good idea, whether it's your livestock or your plants. 
Anyway, I hope that my mistake will help some of you. Hi, John. Hi, Lisa. Ben Ochart here. Thank you for including me in this. You asked for uh, my biggest fish keeping mistake, and, and here it is. I actually have two of them for you. One was uh, adjusting the outputs of some canister filters in an attempt to create uh, a circular motion uh, in the tank, a circular water flow pattern. And what I ended up doing was eliminating surface tension breakup and starving the fish of oxygen. I res that resulted in the loss of some stock, uh, which was quite a setback for me. And uh, the other one was uh, misdiagnosing uh, Colomeris thinking it was something else, thinking it was a fungal infection and treating it uh, that way and only later discovering that it was Colomeris. And by the time I discovered what it really was, I had lost 50% uh, of my stock. And uh, so those are certainly uh, my two biggest fish keeping mistakes. Both of them uh, were major setbacks. And uh, so that's it for me. Thank you for including me in this. I appreciate it. What is up y'all? I'm Jeffro with Jeffro's Fish Keeping and I'm here to tell you guys about the biggest mistake I've ever made in the fish keeping hobby. And I basically purchased a tank that had over a hundred sword tails in it from a guy off of Craigslist. I got a bunch of bags to bag up the fish and nets and a cooler and I went to pick them up. And when I did, the guy that was there talked me into just draining down the tank to four inches away from the bottom instead of bagging up all the fish. I reluctantly went ahead and did this and I started home with the fish. And whenever I got home, I lost at least half of the colony. The moral of the story is don't be lazy. Whenever you're moving a tank, make for sure and get all your fish out properly. Don't try to move the tank with water in it because not only could you lose your fish, but you could also break the tank. So my biggest fish keeping mistake happened about 10 or 12 years ago and I feel really ashamed to even admit this, but I've had a lot of guilt that I've carried around because of this mistake. It's really bad, it's cringeworthy. Um, so what I did was I took fish decorating to a whole nother level where some people, you know, will put fish in a little bowl or something and stick them on, use them as centerpieces for weddings. I decided I was going to go buy 24 betas, stick them in little bowls, decorate the bowls with fancy little marbles and hand them out as party favors for my daughter's birthday party. Cause I thought that would be a really cool unique and creative party favor. Something you never really hear about, right? Well, I felt bad about that because that's, there's probably 24 fish that lived in a little bowl or maybe upgraded to a vase their whole entire life because I gave them as a party favor to six or seven year old children. And I didn't know any better because at the time I wasn't an experienced fish keeper. So I thought I was doing something really nice and fun for my daughter. Anyways, if you've watched our videos, you know that beta should be in a five gallon or larger with proper filtration and a heater. I wish I knew that 10 or 12 years ago. What's up guys? IFG, the inquisitive fish guy. John asked me to share with you what was my worst fish keeping mistake since being in the hobby. I would have to say it would be trying to transport fish from home to home. Now, my recent move, I ended up having to donate some fish. Uh, as of right now, I still have fish at one of my local fish stores and I also had to sell a few fish. And um, guys, you do not want to risk the life of the fish just trying to transport them from home to home. Just my opinion. When I uh, moved here to this spot, I had like a total of nine tanks. I tried to move every single fish from one home to the other and it just didn't work out as I planned. So 
I would say that is my worst mistake in the aquarium hobby, trying to move a huge amount of fish from home to home. Do keep in mind, guys, always think about the life of the fish. If you are not able to successfully and you do not have, let's say, the resources to do such a thing, please don't attempt it. That was my worst mistake, trying to move fish from home to home, a huge amount of fish that is. Peace. I'm out. Hey everybody, Susie Q here from Q Aquatics and Exotics. And today I want to talk about one of the biggest mistakes I made early on. I didn't quarantine. I had this beautiful tank set up of ambunas and clown loaches and the rock sculpture was gorgeous and I found at a big pet store this clown loach for sale. And when I brought it home, I remembered how hard it was to capture the other clown loaches out of the smaller tank and put them in the 55. So I'll figure I'll just put it in. Um, I had done it once before with no issues. What's a big deal? Well, it was a big deal. <laughs> that clown loach had ick, gave all my clown loaches, all my fish ick. Um, the cichlids were flashing off the rocks. I lost all my clown loaches. Um, they didn't survive. I had one lone survivor. I still have the one lone survivor still in with my ambunas today. Um, but I didn't quarantine. One simple step to observe my fish for several weeks. I really observe them, see how they eat, watch how they poop, uh, check their scales, make sure they're getting plumper and not thinner. Um, I don't usually medicate unless I see that there's an issue in quarantine, but I quarantine my fish now. I learned the hard way. I won't do that again. I think the one thing we all have in common about keeping fish is we've all made mistakes. I know I've got my personal one, but uh, I wonder which horseman of the apocalypse you might be. It's one thing to lose a new fish or something. Maybe you get a fish and it's not too healthy. Uh, maybe you quarantine, maybe you don't. Uh, there's been a lot of times where I did not quarantine my fish and it's worked out great. However, one time in particular where I didn't quarantine my fish, everything went terribly wrong. See, I had this school of rummy nose and they had been getting kind of old and starting to die off and they went from 10 down to, you know, maybe four or so over the course of, you know, five years. So I thought it'd be neat to bring home 10 more rummy nose and really boost up the school and kind of bring it, you know, revive it a little bit. Trouble is, rummy nose are really prone to disease. And uh, the rummy nose I brought home uh, were sick. And it wasn't ick or anything I could easily identify either. It's just suddenly things started dying and then everything started dying. It escalated to where I lost just about everything in the tank except for a bristle nose, a really tough yo-yo loach that's still alive today. And just a handful of other, you know, less interesting fish. So a lot of people talk about quarantine and I haven't always done it. Uh, you're not gonna always do it, maybe, but you probably should. And if you don't, you should think about it, especially with some species that are just more prone to disease than others. Don't be a horseman of the apocalypse. Hi, I'm Alex and I run a YouTube channel called Tank Tested. Today I was asked to share with you the story of my biggest aquarium failure. Well, for me, that happened just a few months before I started tank testing. I had a 75 gallon aquarium filled to the brim with nano fish. It had taken me years to collect them all. I had schools of fish like uh, pygmy quarry cats and chili raspora, thousands of dollars worth of fish. And to keep the tank looking sleek, I had a canister filter and an inline heater. Well, uh, the connectors of my canister filter weren't quite as tight as I had hoped they'd be, and I was getting just a little bit of leakage. Drip by drip, water was pouring onto my inline heater, and eventually it failed. Overnight, the temperature of my tank rose from mid-70s to about 110 degrees. Absolutely everything died, including most of the plants that I had in that aquarium. The result is not just that I lost thousands of dollars worth of fish and plants, it's that I'm directly responsible for the death of more than a hundred fish. 
I took them and put them in an artificial environment, and I failed to make sure that they were safe. Yeah, the equipment failed, but I should have had a redundancy for that. So now, if I do put a heater in my tank, which I don't that often, I use a secondary outlet that uh, has a thermometer attached to it so that if the heater fails and the temperature rises too high, that outlet will shut off and stop the heater from continuing to heat the water column. So that's the story of my biggest aquarium failure. So there you go. You've heard all of our nightmare stories. You know you're not in it alone. You know you've probably done at least one of them. So why don't you comment below and tell me what your biggest mistake was. The one you're willing to admit to at least, but you gotta understand, I admitted something that I held in for a very long time and I actually feel a little bit better about it. Still have that guilt though. So tell me what your biggest mistake was and there you go. Thank you for watching and thank you so much to all the other YouTubers that participated in this video. It really means a lot to John and I and we really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. This really was a lot of fun and I think that the last three videos will save a lot of heartache and probably a lot of fish lives. So we'll see you next week for 10 more things.